before we, uh, we get into the message for today, I have to apologize to you guys. Uh, so after I talked about overflow, I, I sat down and uh, my wife asked me what's wrong. And uh, sometimes I need her to help me process, you know, what I'm actually thinking or feeling. And uh, she just was like, yeah, like you're, she knew as I was explaining it, like, I'm such a passionate person. When I'm talking about engaging with the community, I hold back. And a lot of it's because I don't want to make people feel bad, like genuinely. I don't want to make people here feel like that's not my thing. And like you're, you're saying this to me in a way that's making me feel like if I don't do this stuff, I'm not a part of like this church, right? And uh, one thing my wife had said to me earlier in the week is, you know, with that house, she'll go down to the basement and clear out cobwebs, right? I will not do that. <laughs> Straight up. I don't do spiders. I don't, like, so that's, that's her con- contribution, right? And there's going to be a way for people to jump in in so many different ways. But I'm telling you all this right now. One, one day I was heading over here for youth group and uh, a woman caught me right at the corner. I live across the street. She caught me at the corner and uh, she was like faded. Like she could barely get her words out and uh, she asked for a ride to MLK in university. So I walked over to the church and I asked Chris Saldana if I could borrow his car. And I bring her over there and before she got out, I was like, hey, can I, can I just pray with you? And I prayed with her and she just bawled. She bawled like people are hurting. People are hurting in this neighborhood. And they, they need hope. They genuinely need people who want to be in their life and want to build relationships with them and want to love on them and just hear them and, and sit in the mess that is life. They need it. So the, the food in the house, it's just an opportunity to welcome people in so we can truly know them and be in relationship with them. After our last member meeting, I, I came out and uh, Jess and Mal got me because there was a domestic dispute in the parking lot. Like the, this couple was arguing so hard, the windows were all fogged up. So uh, a dude who was homeless was the one who pointed it out to them. So I went out and talked with him and uh, his name's Kenny. And after the, they drove off and uh, me and Robbie Baker just talked with him and uh, again, just said, hey, can we pray with you? This, this is a grown man. And he, so he, had, he, he needs a surgery done because he has a bag that, like, is sit, that sits on him that helps to like, get rid of waste, right? So because of that bag, he, he, he knows Jesus and he wants to come into church, but he's so scared that people are going to dismiss him because he smells bad, right? So we pray with this man. Again, tears running down his face. It's like genuine brokenness that people need community they need friends. Like, one thing that we overestimate in our own lives is the power of just being able to call someone and be like, hey, I need help with something. We have networks that are invisible to us, right? But when you don't have true community, you don't have people that you can just call and say, hey, something's broken in my house. Can you come fix it? Hey, I need a ride over here. Can, can, you, can you come get me? Can you do these little things for me in life, right? So, um, again, if that's not your thing, that's okay. But if you have been at Cottage Grove for years now and you have been looking to get plugged in to directly meet needs of people in the neighborhood, to build relationships with them, overflow is for you. This is your time. This is finally the time to step up and say, let's do this together. All right, well, after that. Uh, So straight up, I'm I'm going to be real with y'all. I try to give you guys the behind the scenes of uh, what's going on, because I, I know for myself when I was growing up, and I would see these sermons, right, you think these things just come out of thin air. They do not. They do not come out of thin air. So I'll tell you how I envisioned my week, right? I knew I was going to Des Moines Christian on Thursday. I had two talks, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, two different talks I had to do, right? And then after that, I was like, man, we have Friday off. Saturday is Drake Relays. Y'all know I'm a track head. I'm like, I'm watching track all weekend. I don't got nothing to do. Ryan Kennedy was supposed to be preaching, then the man got sick. I was like, like, yo, out of all weekends, man. But you know what? What it shows us is that we think we are in control, right? But God has different plans sometimes, and we have to submit to his plans over the way we want, want things to be in our own lives. And that's totally okay. That's totally okay. 
So today as we get in God's word, what we're going to be seeing, what we're going to be learning about is that he never fails the test. He never fails. And I want to start off with a question. How often do you test the Lord and he actually proves himself faithful and your only response is to test him again? Instead of recognizing how good he has been in your life, we, we, we can set up these moving goalposts, right? God, do this. He passes the test, then we just move the goalposts, and we just keep moving the goalposts. Here in the text today, the focus shifts as the Egyptians have been removed from this story, right? But here's what we need to, to, to really think about. The, the bad guy has been removed from the story, right? Even when we, when we watch shows and movies, we, we need a bad guy, right? Because we need someone to blame for all of the problems. But there's no more bad guy. The old way of life has been shattered. And Dakota touched on this last week in chapter 14. They want to go back to what they know. They want to go back to what they are, are, are used to. Even if it wasn't good, they still want to go back to it. Israel is scared here. And initially, it, it was because of the Egyptian army, but now it's because of, of the wilderness and, and the unknown. And, and they're scared of what rebuilding their lives from scratch actually looks like. Now, one of the uh, illustrations that uh, Ryan had in his notes, uh, I actually left it because I, I, love, I love our congregation so much. I know some of y'all will get this. If I was listening to this sermon, I would have no idea what this man was talking about. I'm going to read what he had. <laughs> he says, like Bilbo longing to be on adventures, even though his friends died, he was threatened by dragons and lived in fear. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea. That's like some Lord of the Rings, Hobbit stuff. I don't know. I know the Hullings love that. I know my wife loves it. I don't know. But if that doesn't make sense for this context, go take it up with Ryan Kennedy. I'm throwing him all the way under the bus on that one. I don't even care. But in the passage today, we're going to see God introduce himself to Israel. And he makes three, three things clear. He's going to make a promise, he's going to test Israel, and consequently they're going to test him back. But then lastly, he will give Israel victory. Please stand for the reading of God's word. We are in Exodus 15, we're reading verses 22 to 27 today. And if you're reading the Pew Bible, it should be page 57. God's word says this. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Merah, they could not drink the water of Merah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Merah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, if you will dil diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his command commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today, humble Lord, recognizing who you are, that you are our healer, God, that you hear us, heal us spiritually like no one else can, God. I pray today for our congregation, Lord, that we leave here today recognizing your truths, recognizing your promise, promises, and being willing to submit, God. Lord, today we need you, God. We need you to give us direction, Lord. We need you to give us clarity. And Lord, I pray that you just use me as a vessel, God. 
like you did with Moses, God. Just use me to present your word today, God, and let, let my words be pleasing to you, God. Please make your Holy Spirit present this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So we see he makes Israel a promise, right? And we've had this wonderful exodus happen, right? They are now free from the Egyptians, free from from the slavery that had oppressed them. But it, it doesn't take long for them to start to run into some issues here. And it starts off with having no water, right? They're mad because they don't have any water. And then that turns into the finding water and that water being bitter water that they can't drink. And at this point, you have to imagine, God has led them in this direction, so they're now getting frustrated, right? They're getting frustrated with God. But what they do is, you see in verse 24, they, they grumble to Moses. Now, this reminds me a lot of uh, a, a family joke that I have that when we were growing up, uh, I used to play football growing up, and there was one Sunday, uh, we're at the field, and uh, a parent was getting rowdy in the back, and this guy up front told him to shut up without looking back. He just told him to shut up. And the guy stands up, he's like, what'd you say? And he turns around and looks at him, and this is a massive man. And he goes, I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to you. And he points to the scrawniest guy in the stands. <laughs> and this is what Israel is doing here. They don't want that smoke with God. Are you crazy? They've seen the ten plagues. They've seen what happened to the firstborn. They've seen the, the, the Red Sea part and then come down on the Egyptian army. They're not going at God, so they have to blame it on Moses. But here's the thing. In typical fashion, what does Yahweh do? He fills their need. He tells Moses what to do. So he gets him to grab a log in verse 25, and he tells him to throw it into the water, and miraculously, the water becomes sweet so that they can drink it. He provides for them. And then on top of that, he makes them a, a promise to actually alleviate their fears in this moment. We see this in verse 26. He doesn't have to do all this stuff, but God is gracious and good, and he does it for them anyways. And what, what he sets up here is actually a, a two-sided co covenant. And in this, Israel actually had a duty to fulfill. God promises to withhold his judgment and wrath, similar to like what he did with Pharaoh, right? But Pharaoh didn't listen, so he experienced the full wrath of God. And the same is true for the Israelites. If they fail, then they are open to the judgment of God. And the last part in verse 26, God reveals himself as your healer. Eugene Carpenter in his commentary of Exodus, he points out that Israel was likely used to the Egyptian way of, of, of medicine at that time. So that included the, the, the false gods and the rituals and all this stuff. And the point he's trying to make here is that he is the replacement for their old way of life. The old is gone. All the, way of do, all the ways of doing things as they did with the Egyptians, that's now out the window. They now need to depend on God for everything. Before he says he is their healer, he's so good, he does it first, and he provides for them, and he gives them the life-giving water. Now, after the, the promise and after his healing, we now move into the test. It isn't long after Israel sets up from Elam, and once again, what are they doing? They're complaining. Now, I, I want to say this. In, in, in chapter 16, this is the part in Scripture for me personally where I find I start shaking my head a lot. And this continues as we go through Judges and all these books, but it's like they're, they're continuing to just do the same thing over and over again. But you know what we forget in these moments? That if someone documented out our entire story, someone just wrote out your whole life, all the details of your life, it would be the same. We'd be reading it like, is this guy, is Ian doing that again? We just, when we just hear, he's testing God again. God just proved himself to be faithful, and we're right back here again. This is us, y'all. This is what we do. Now, this time when they're grumbling, 
Instead of it being about water, it's about food this time. And in 16.3, they reveal in their hearts again that they're longing to go back to Egypt. And they say, (laughs) I love this, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out to the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Y'all, sin makes us so delusional that when we look back on it, we think it was better than it was. At what point in Scripture did it talk about them being enslaved and, 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 and having barbecued chicken? Like, it, that's never mentioned. But yet, when it's what we're comfortable with, we love to go back to what we're comfortable with, even when it's not a good thing. And at this moment, they're still calling out Aaron and Moses, and they're pointing them right back to God. And what's happening here, it's almost like they don't want to fully accept that God is with them. They don't want to accept it. So God goes first, but, but with a test. And in 16.4, he says, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And in 1620, it doesn't take long. What does Israel do? They fail the test, y'all. They fail. They don't listen to him. And God is still so good, he provided a way to, for them to even be obedient to the Sabbath, right? So they could go and collect food on the sixth day and gather enough for two days so they wouldn't have to do anything on the Sabbath. But again, in 1628, They disobey. They don't trust in the Lord, and they go off wandering and don't find any food. And this brings us to chapter 17, where water once again becomes a problem. And Israel complains to Moses, but this time it's starting to escalate into actual, like, quarreling or or even protesting. But we have to know, at this point, God has been upholding his promises For 40 years, they've been eating the the, the quail and the manna. For 40 years, he's been showing up day in and day out. But once again, what do they do? They point back to wanting to go to Egypt. They point back to where they came from, what God had rescued them from. This reminds me a lot of, there's there's an Instagram account that, all this guy posts, like he's built up this huge following. All he posts is shooting guns, uh, partying, girls, and working out, right? And I, I saw this interview, and they were interviewing a, a billionaire who follows him. And they asked him, why do you follow him? And he said, well, I'm married. I can't live that life anymore. So he lives through this guy's Instagram account. Now, take this in now. Because before you say, oh, I would never do that, hold up. I was thinking of this example in my own life. Uh, So in 2012, between when I found out I made the Olympic team to actually leaving for the, to go over to London, we went to a training camp in Ottawa before we went to Germany. And I, I was sitting there with my brother. So I made the Olympic team with my brother, right? We're sitting there in the hotel, and this movie came on called Project X, right? And, we're, and this whole movie, just, these, these high school kids throw this insane party. And we're watching this movie locked in. And all we're saying to ourselves is, we want to go back to that. Deep in our hearts, that's all we want to do. We're, li- we're living out a dream, and all we want to do is go back to living in sin. Oh, it would be so great to throw this crazy party that has the cops come and gets everybody in trouble. Oh, it would be so good. But this is what we do. And if some of you are honest, some of the shows you watch, some of the things you choose to consume, you do it because deep down inside you want to live that. Deep down in your heart, you're like, that would be so much fun to go back to that. I'm married, but oh man, it'd be so good to go back to how I was when I was single. It'd be so good to go back to the good old college days, right? We use these things because we want to go back to Egypt. It's like they have forgotten at this point that the Lord has shown up for 40 years and proven himself over and over again. And 
when we're talking about moving goalposts to start this off, it's similar to people who are like, I'll believe in God once he does this. God does that thing. Well, I'll believe in him when, and we just keep moving those goalposts. Lastly, what we see to end off chapter 17 is he gives Israel victory. A foe comes out to oppose Israel, and God utterly destroys them. And he once again saves his rebellious people. It's amazing. They've been complaining and complaining and complaining, but he loves them so much he still chooses to rescue them. And this is nothing new, and we see this over and over again throughout Scripture. The Lord providing, us failing to obey, the Lord acting with grace and healing his people, and this happens over and over again. We see this with Adam and Eve, right? God provided the garden and his presence. All they had to do was not eat from the tree, and they did that. They disobeyed. And God could have killed them physically right there in that moment. They had a spiritual death, but he could have physically killed them as well. But instead, he sent them out covered. In Deuteronomy 1, we see this with Israel. God commanded Israel to take out the Amorites. They did not do it. And there was some punishment for disobeying. But the Lord ultimately brought them to the promised land, regardless of what they did. We see this in 1 Samuel 8. Israel rejects God, right? They're like, no, we don't want God. We need a king. We want a king. So God provides a king. That king disobeys God. So God provides another king in David. And David's looking sweet for a while, right? But then eventually he fails as well. Peter, what does he do? He rejects Jesus. And eventually he is restored by Jesus. And what do we do? We reject God and choose ourselves over him. We walk away from the truth for a lie. But there was one who became the fulfillment of all of God's promises, who healed not only others, but himself. In Luke 4, we see the the Spirit lead him out into the wilderness, right? And at that point, he was the one who did not have food. He was the one who did not have water. He was hungry. He was thirsty. But y'all, he did not grumble even one time, proving that he is our high priest and he's able to and he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He was obedient ah, his entire life, even to the point of death on a cross. And after that death on a cross, he rose victorious. He rose victorious. He is victory. He is victory. He is victory. He is victory over sin. He is victory over death. He is victory over hate. He is victory over lies. He is victory over fear. He is victory over confusion, over lust, over loneliness, over depression. He is victory over illness, over suffering, over hunger, over thirst, over anxiety. He is victory not only over one law, over two laws, no, not over 10 laws. He is victory over all 613 Old Testament laws. He is victory. He is victory, completely, fully. He did what we could never do on our own because we cannot fulfill our side of the bargain. We can't do it. We've tried over and over again. We see it in Scripture. We try and fulfill it, and we cannot do it. We need him to show up and be present. We need him to do only what he can do. And his name is Jesus, and he is completely faithful He is completely faithful to his promises. Now, Cottage Grove, I don't know where you are at today, but for the Christians, especially when you are are wanting to, to test him, my question for you is, are you listening? Are you listening for how God is actually sanctifying you and making you his In chapter 15, verse 26, it says, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, how much time in your week do you spend diligently listening to God's voice? 
waiting on him. Cottage Grove, are, are you trusting the promises of God or are you just too busy testing him? Saying, if, if, if God will do this, then I will serve him. If God will make this thing happen, then I will finally go and, and, and share the gospel with my, my coworkers and my, and my neighbors. When, when God moves me into the job I want, maybe I'll, I'll start to give then. Maybe if I'm, I'm here at Cottage Grove for just one more year, I need to get a little bit more comfortable before I finally join a connection group. Or maybe you're like, you know what, I'm just going to hang back until these elders finally find a lead pastor, right? What are you waiting for? What God has called you to has nothing to do with anyone else. If God has called you to it, you need to be obedient to what God has called you to. It's time that we, we step out on faith to the work that God has prepared for us. That requires trusting in him. It requires walking in his promises. And it might be hard, right? There's nothing in scripture that says it's going to be easy all the time. You may have doubts, and that is okay, but Jesus has gone before us. He has proven himself, and he has passed every single test, and he is victorious. And for those who do not believe, Maybe you are still testing him today and continuing to move those goalposts, wanting to see more, right? Like just like the Israelites, needing to see more before you finally believe. And maybe God has actually proven himself to you in a number of ways, but you just refuse to acknowledge it. But here's what you need to know today. It is a historical certainty that Jesus existed that he lived and walked the earth. And most scholars today believe that after Jesus was executed, his tomb actually lay empty. Many, many of the people who wrote scripture were martyred. They were killed for their faith. Why would they be willing to be killed for their faith? Because they believed in this thing that much. They saw the man live. They saw him die. They saw him resurrected. And they were willing to give life up for this thing. Don't just sit on your questions. See, people will have questions, right? And, and never come to the truth to get answers. They'll just sit on those questions. Years later, you talk to them. They're asking the same questions. On, at youth group on Wednesday, my man says to me, uh, Ian, Muslims and uh, Christians worship the same God. I asked this man one question. How do you know that? And a big smile cracks on his face. And he goes, bro, I don't know. And I'll tell you why he smiled. He smiled because he knows he's never looked into it. He didn't actually look for any answers. You have to take it from, from me because I'm biased because I'm a preacher, right? Go to scripture and see if there's anywhere where Jesus says that he is the only way. Because if he does say that, that means it's incompatible. It means it can't be true. But he didn't look into it. So that was my challenge to him, to look into it. Ask those questions and actually seek the answers because they've been provided for us. And if you want to put your faith in Jesus today or you just have questions, come talk to me after. And I know there's plenty of people in this congregation who would love to walk through Scripture with you, who would love to show you the truth and help you to have hope in Jesus Christ like they have. I'm going to pray us out and then we are going to enter into a time of communion. So ushers, you can come up. Dear Lord, help us to be faithful to you, God. Help us to see you as the master of our lives that you are, God. Remove the distractions and help us die to ourselves so that we can truly pick up our crosses and follow you, God that we can give up the things that we hold on to, Lord, so that we can truly, truly understand what it means to follow you and be obedient, God. Lord, even when we have questions, Lord, help us to dig, dig in, Lord. Help us to come to you. Help us to spend more time listening and waiting for you, God, to show up and reveal yourself to us like you have so many times in our lives, God. 
as a congregation, Lord, we need you. We are completely dependent on you, and we cannot do anything apart from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.